Good afternoon, Santa Clarita, and everyone listening in to, from around the world. You are listening right here to KHTS, your hometown station. I'm Sharon Brubaker, and you are listening to the Grief Recovery Hour. If you are listening to this program today, there's a huge probability that your heart may be broken. It could be caused from a death, either recent or long ago, or it could be caused from the breakup of a romantic relationship, or any other of the 43 losses that we know can cause a broken heart experience. I'm not here to tell you how you feel because you already know. At best, I can tell you that I absolutely know what it felt like when my broken heart occurred and it was not good. I am really hoping that through this hour, I can give you some light and absolutely help you understand a little bit better today. We are Facebook Live. I'm always excited that we're Facebook Live. So please feel free to pop in any questions you may have. We'll do our best to answer them during the show. Please give us some love on that Facebook Live. We love it when you guys look at it and you show us and you encourage us that way. All questions will be asked anonymously for sure. I have an amazing guest today and her name is Sandy Atmore. Sandy is a life coach and an advanced certified grief recovery specialist as well, but she is also my mentor, my coach, and my really great friend, and I just had to have her on the show. We've been talking about it for a while. Welcome, Sandy. Oh, thank you, Sharon. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Isn't it cool? Don't you love talking about grief? I do. Yeah. It's my passion. It is totally my passion as well, and mostly because people think it's a conversation they shouldn't be having. So true. So true. So I'm so honored to have you here for this hour. But why don't you introduce yourself to our audience and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So um, as Sharon mentioned, I'm a life coach and I'm an advanced certified grief recovery specialist. So I work with lots and lots of people, really supporting them in working through a grieving process, as well as helping them to reach goals, whether it's marketing goals or career goals. And then also, I am the wife of Larry Atmore. I have uh, four children, Andrew, Lawrence, Zaina, and Elijah. And I'm also a grandma, so I have two grandchildren. That, one of those is your really important job, and it's probably the being the wife. However, the grandbaby is probably a close second. It sure is. <laughs> it really is. Oh, my gosh. It's so much <laughs> the best, fun. isn't it? Oh, my goodness. So, Sandy, tell me, how long have you been uh, teaching grief recovery at How long have you been uh, in the program? So I participated in the program myself in 2006, and it was a tremendous help for me. So in 2010, I got certified to teach the process and to take people through it. And then I went full-time in 2012. So I've been doing this full-time for the last six years. Wow, that's amazing. So why don't you share with us as much or as little as you like about what actually brought you here? What actually brought you to grief recovery? What brought you to searching it out? Absolutely. You know, for me, I didn't think that grief recovery would be something that I needed because I, though I had experienced some death in my life, it they weren't significant deaths. However, what I did experience is that I grew up in a home where there was a lot of abuse. So I was physically abused, verbally abused, and sexually abused for the majority of my childhood. I was raped when I was almost eight years old. I was raped again when I was 12 years old. So we had this home with chaos and pain and, you know, uh, people around me that were hurting me as I was growing up. And then the other ingredient in my home was denial. So there were bad things happening and nobody was talking about it. Mm -hmm. So the people that weren't hurting me were pretending like nothing's happening. And I really took that and internalized it. And then I went out into my own life and I really perpetuated a lot more Mm self-destruction. You know, I was very driven because I was hurting so much inside. But at the same time, I was using alcohol and drugs and I was acting out and that culminated in a three and a half year meth addiction. So I was addicted to meth and I used it pretty much daily for three and a half years. So in 2005, I walked away from meth 
which is miraculous, right? You look at that and you go, oh my gosh, like you walked away and that was amazing. But even though I had walked away and I wasn't using anymore and there's a miracle in that, my heart was still broken. Mm -hmm. You see, even though I had not experienced death or even, um, I had experienced divorce with my parents when I was older, but I had experienced so many losses. You know, I grew up and I lost safety and trust and purity, and innocence, and control, and identity. I didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. And I had stuffed all those things and blocked them out and pretended like they didn't happen, and I had just lost me in all of it. So even though I had walked away from meth, my heart was broken. And really, meth was a way that I coped. So when I didn't have that anymore, all the pain, right? All the pain was coming up. And I was starting to connect into all these experiences and I really didn't know what to do with them. I had been in therapy for some time and, and it was helpful. It, it really helped me to start to process what had happened. But in 2006, uh, there were some friends that said, we really want you to do this thing called grief recovery. And I was like, I don't want to go. There was like a group of people and I don't want to be with a group of people. So I went and I got the book and I said, I'm going to just read it myself. And so my friend called me and she said, how's the class going? And I said, oh, you know what? I got the book and I'm just reading through it. And she said, either you make the call or I'm going to make it for you. You need to get in that class. Now that is a very good friend, mm -hmm. really good friend, because I went into the process of grief recovery being one of those people that was so disconnected mm -hmm. and so not able to connect to my life and, you know, just not even able to really sense what I was feeling. I just knew I was in a lot of pain. And I went in just thinking, not going to help me. It's not going to help me. Mm. But then I ended up going through the process. And on the other side, I felt like boulders just got lifted off my shoulders. And so it was the very start of a very different life for me. It changed your world. It completely changed my it world. It completely changed everything. Someone asked me yesterday, they said, um, do you remember that moment in your childhood where things pivoted for you and you just knew it formulated the person you are today? And I, I literally was just looking at him and I thought, that's not when it happened. It happened for me in grief recovery. Yes. It was in grief recovery and the recovery that I knew that my life was going to change and that I was going to start helping everyone. And I feel like prior to grief recovery, the, my life was okay, but it's not like it has been now. So you went through the program and you became recovered. And I'm assuming that you worked on multiple relationships, not just one or two. Yes. And, you know, that leads me to a really great point, you know, you talking about that because, you know, when I entered into the process of grief recovery, um, at that time I had connected to a lot of my abuse. So I knew what had happened. I'd processed some of it, at least intellectually. And there were many family members in my case that had abused me. Unfortunately, a lot of the men in my family were abusers. My main abuser was my father. So when I went into the program, I really thought this is a relationship that I'm going to need to work through. And obviously, if if you're out there and you haven't done grief recovery, it did not involve me interacting with my father. Yes. It, it was a, a place for me to go and be able to walk through this grief without involving the person who was completely unsafe for me to resolve that with. However... Through the initial process, what I realized is, wow, I actually have a lot of pain with my mother. My mother never laid a hand on me. I don't really remember her raising her voice. And if she did, it was non-threatening. Mm -hmm. But my mother didn't protect me. Mm -hmm. There were all these horrible things that happened that my mother just pretended as if they weren't happening. And I had a lot of pain in that relationship, a lot of conflict because I loved my mother and I looked at her as this really generous, amazing person. And yet this person who I was much more attached to than my father had completely failed me. And so that's where I started. So I started there and that was, I didn't expect that, you know, but I started there, I completed the program and then I went on to complete 
many other relationships over the years. I mean, I've lost count at this point, but I'm probably 35 or 40 relationships at least. Right. Mm-hmm. And the and the tools that you've learned from that, you're able to use it in your entire life and everything that happens. Because we know as grief recovery specialists, you can grieve someone who is living or deceased in any situation in your life. So you learn these great, great tools. I want to tap on one other thing here. Okay. We're talking about grief recovery, but you're talking about abuse and verbal abuse. I think a lot of times in society, we don't attach the word grief with abuse. Can you touch on that a little bit more and elaborate on that? Absolutely. And and I love that you're asking about that because I am so grateful. I feel like the reason that I'm here today and that when people interact with me or see me there, they don't, they can't believe what I have walked through. They cannot believe that I was a meth addict. I believe a large part of that is because somebody saw that there was unresolved grief Mm. in my heart. I think otherwise I would have been left kind of half healed. And, and a lot of that is because when we hear the words abuse, you know, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, we think of the word trauma and we think of somebody being traumatized, which is true. What we don't then equate to it is that there is grief in trauma. I've lost something, right? Grief means I am responding to a loss of any kind. Mm -hmm. And any time that I have experienced a traumatic experience, I've lost something. There's something that's been lost in my heart. And there's an emotional response that I've had that has remained unfinished inside. And I find this to be particularly true with abuse. As a matter of fact, I feel like a lot of the clients that I work with are abuse clients. Not everyone, but I do work with a lot of abuse cases because I think when you're able to give somebody who's experienced that kind of abuse language for what they have lost, what they wish would have been better, different, or more, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you've opened up this place within their heart and within their spirit where they have an opportunity to gain healing where they can't find it any other place. I had a lot to grieve. Yeah. There was the things that I lost as a child, but there were also uh, the ways in which I missed out on my parents providing the things that parents should provide. Right. Uh, All the dreams in my heart that got crushed, all the things that I internalized as being my fault that stole the essence of my identity right? So those were all things that I needed to grieve. And so for people out there, when they've experienced abuse, I think a lot of times what happens is they, again, it's, it's, it's seen as a traumatic event. And I am going to maybe be diagnosed with, I have PTSD, mm-hmm. I've been traumatized, and I'm labeled with these things. But my heart is not addressed. Yeah. And you miss out when you don't ad- address the heart of the matter. The brokenness in your heart. Yeah. And there, there was a time, so from 2005 to 2006, you were basically sober, living your life, and which a lot of people will call their new normal, right? And a lot of times I'm hearing, I just heard this on the radio the other day, that, that the new normal is just bad, it's lacking, it's without, and it's with loss and pain. But then you had this second new normal after grief recovery. Can you compare the two right there for me and kind of tell me what that was like? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, So 2005 is when I walked away from meth and I literally walked away. Three and a half years, I was, I smoked it Mm -hmm. every day. And if you, if anybody knows anything about that drug, it's a horrific drug. If you ever see anybody that's using that drug, they don't, their appearance changes drastically. It's highly addictive. It steals a lot. So I came off of that. I walked away, big miracle, big deal, kind of stood up for myself in terms of this abuse has happened. And that's what gave me the strength to do that. However, what you're saying is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. My new normal at that point was I'm not using, and now I have to pick up the pieces of my life and I have all this pain inside. Just because I'm not using anymore, it didn't heal me. All it said is you're not coping in this way anymore. And so then I was looking for more acceptable coping strategies. Mm -hmm. I don't want to use drugs, but what else can I do to cope? 
I'm going to drink coffee every single day. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to bury myself in work. You know, I'm going to do anything that I am going to daydream as much as I can. I'm going to do everything that I can to avoid the present moment because the present moment is still painful. So painful. Very. And that was my new normal. And I think, yes, people could look at me in that moment and go, oh my goodness, you're not using anymore. That's amazing. I didn't feel amazing inside. Yeah. Now we go to 2006 where I do the the process of grief recovery and I feel these boulders lifting from my shoulders and then I continue to use these tools, right? I didn't just stop with that one part of the process, but I kept using these tools and I kept resolving the pieces of my heart and I became whole. And so what happened was instead of me trying to avoid the present moment for the first time in my life, as, at least as far back as I can remember, I was present. I experienced the present moment. I, hadn't, I didn't know what that was like. People talked about experiencing the present. I'm in the present and I feel all these feelings. And I was like, I have no clue what that even means. I'd never experienced it before. And honestly, I would have these moments of going, oh, look at how beautiful the sky is and look at the trees and look at the grass because it, it was something I had just never been close enough within my spirit to see. Right. I began to experience, experience joy and I connected with purpose. I was like, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm supposed to do. I have purpose for the first time I have value. So that to me was light years from my normal after not using anymore. Exactly. Exactly. I remember the morning, the moment in my life where I was standing in the kitchen and it was after I had done many relationships and I was just standing there and one day I just thought this thought, I'm happy. And it was just lighter. It was just this lighter moment. And it was so amazing because I too have done a lot of relationships. Now, you are doing a lot with abuse and sexual abuse in the age of the Me Too, which you guys have totally collided, which is amazing. Power to you. That is so great. Can you share a little bit about how that, uh, that awareness has really helped your business and how it's changed in associating grief with that movement where people are really talking about it now, right? Absolutely. I think the Me Too campaign has been one of the most amazing movements that I've seen in bringing awareness to sexual abuse and sexual assault for starters. Um, I do want to say that for somebody who kind of came out of being sexually abused, I, I was trying to heal in an era when there was not a lot of talk about sexual abuse, particularly if it happened as a child. Uh, there was a lot of backlash on if you had a suppressed memory and now you were trying to deal with it and is that real and is that not? And, you know, trying to kind of walk through a time of, I'm trying to heal from something and a lot of the world doesn't even believe that it happened or understand the significance. Fast forward to now with the Me Too campaign, that's done a couple of different things. One, it has raised awareness. So culturally, we are much more aware right. that sexual assault is happening um, to children and it's happening to women in many different industries and that it's a real problem and that it has real ramifications. People are experiencing loss. And we also realize that what's happened is that for people who have experienced sexual abuse or have been sexually assaulted, they're getting triggered because they're seeing it wow. in the media. So I've gotten calls from people who are like, I can't stop crying. Women who are calling me saying, I can't stop crying mm. because I just saw Dr. Nassar on the news and I saw these women, these women gymnasts reading these letters to him. And all of a sudden, my trauma has surfaced and I didn't realize how much it affected me. So that those are the kind of calls that I'm getting. And I think not only is it raising awareness on we need to stop this and we need to do a lot more to be proactive, but it's also helping people who have buried it to come out of darkness into light with what's happened. Absolutely. That's so cool. So just we're going to take a break. But before we get to that break, I would like to have you give some Quick advice to anyone who may be listening to this and getting moved right now, what would be your advice for them to do? Um, call, reach out, get 
talk to someone? What What is your, just off the top of your head, what is it? Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely to call, reach out, talk to someone, get help. Here's the, the problem with abuse, particularly when we're talking about sexual abuse. It doesn't go away. The, the pain doesn't just go away. It will not dissipate on its own. It doesn't matter if it was five years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, or yesterday. It doesn't matter. The pain is not going to go away. You're going to become really good at, at, at coping and not looking at it, but it's doing damage to you every day. The first step is to get it out and talk and reach out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we are going to take a break. Thank you so much, Sandy. What a compelling story. That is so cool. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we have a couple of questions that some clients have sent over, and we're going to be answering those live on the air. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll catch you back here right after the break. Satisfy your sweet tooth with a bite of sweet perfection from Nothing Bunt Cakes in Valencia. Their decadent cakes are ideal for your next birthday, anniversary, baby shower, wedding, holiday party, and more. Nothing Bunt Cakes makes their treats readily available without compromising quality. You can expect real butter and cream cheese, fresh eggs, and lots of love in each of their 10 luscious flavors. To order your own sweet treat, visit their Valencia Bakery in the Whole Foods Shopping Center or log on to nothingbuntcakes.com. Don't miss Six Flags Memorial Weekend Sale. For one week only, save up to 65% on season passes to the thrill capital of the world. It's the biggest deal of summer. Get a free upgrade to gold with free parking on every pass, free Hurricane Harbor passes, and a bonus free friend ticket. Valid select days. Don't miss out. Buy now at SixFlags.com. Hurry, the Memorial Weekend Sale ends May 28th. Go big. Go Six Flags. Every day after school, children and teens in our community are alone without academic support, access to healthy food and activities, or adults to guide them. With your support, we can provide our youth a second home, support their academic success, and build leaders. Join us Saturday, June 2nd at All That Glitters is Gold, the Boys and Girls Club of Santa Clarita Valley's annual benefit auction. Visit scvbgc.org or call us at 661-254-CLUB to purchase your your tickets your your hometown station hey everyone welcome back you are listening right here to khts your hometown station and my name is sharon brubaker and you are listening to the grief recovery hour and my special guest today is sandy atmora she's a life coach advanced certified grief recovery specialist and just prior to the show we were doing a lot of sharing on sexual abuse trauma our backgrounds how we got into grief recovery which was absolutely amazing and we talked a little bit about the me too movement and how it has really um, spun the the business and really been great for awareness right So we had a couple of questions that we wanted to answer here on the air. We're going to segue over. So I have a question that came across. This is my fiance died two years ago. He was everything to me. It hurts today as bad as it did when it first happened. But when I think about it, I'm so angry. And she says, is that normal? I don't know why. Why did we meet? Why did it all seem so perfect? Why did we not have time to get married? Why did he get cancer? I don't know why. Mm. Yeah. So um, we can just both split it up and just kind of answer. And I think that, um, bless your heart, sweetie. Thank you so much for this question that you're sending over for sure. I don't know how you feel. I share that quite often, but I know what a broken heart feels like. But I think a lot of times is that we go after that why. I think what she's really saying here is why, 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 why? And a lot of times we don't get that answer. But working through some of the loss and the pain helps to reveal a lot of things for us, right? I remember when Austin died, that was the question that er that was immediately after that just kept coming in my head. And almost like you're, you're yelling it out there and you just don't even know where to go with it. And she wants to know, is this normal? What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's perfectly normal. Yeah. Yeah, perfectly normal. I love what you were uh, talking about, Sharon, about that is a place that we go. We, we Why is it a question that we ask? It's the cry of the heart. Right. 
the heart wants to know why we have this attachment with this person, like you had your nephew, and we have this special attachment, and then that attachment is is broken. And we want to know why. Why did that happen? Because our heart is trying to figure out how to figure this out. And if I can figure out the why, then I'll feel better. Right. But the problem is, is that a lot of times even understanding the why isn't enough because that's not really what our hearts need. I think asking those questions is, is, is really a great thing because it does start to get you to open up to what do I wish was better, different, or more? It does start to open up my heart and say, this is where the pain is. But really what the heart needs is a process to be able to get a resolve and to be heard rather than trying to figure out the answer. And that's exactly where I was going to go yeah. with that. Because I feel also is that grievers need to be heard and listened to with respect. It's so important, I find, some, Sandy, sometimes just that first 40 minutes with clients where they just can talk about it helps to relieve some steam, right? It helps to help blow it off. And they're not maybe not getting the answer to their why, but they get some release. And that is so important. Also understanding that grief is a normal and natural reaction to a loss of any kind and that we've got to go through this, right? And having a guide like yourself or myself to walk with them is so rewarding and so different, right? In that sense, for sure. Yeah. I wanted to add one other thing too that I thought was so important about this question and such a a great thing about it is she's saying it happened two years ago. You know, one of the things that I, I tell people, if you are in a situation where you have a friend or uh, somebody that you work with, or somebody that you know that's experienced a loss, such as death, sometimes what happens is is we can think, oh, well, okay, they experienced the death, there's the loss, we've been through the funeral, okay, now we're ready to move forward. And so many times for people when they experience this kind of loss, a lot of times the reality of the new normal, as we were Mm -hmm. talking about, the reality of the life being changed and that person not being here for all these events really sets in. And oftentimes that person will feel more grief in a sense or feel the grief more clearly, not less. So it's really important too that I think that we realize that we do need to honor people's experience. And I think for for this listener, you know, for her to understand that it it will take her connecting with someone. Absolutely. And uh, piggybacking on that, a lot of times what happens is that as society, we have put on our mind and our heart when we feel her grief should be done. Absolutely. And we, two months, three months, have decided we don't want to see you posting that on, on Facebook anymore. We don't want to hear those stories anymore. We're done with that. And so quite often grievers are told, are you still dealing with that? Isn't it time for you to get over that? Isn't it time for you to move on? And that gets them to where they then stop talking about it because they don't have a safe place to talk about it. I don't have a safe place to talk about this, so I'm just going to not tell anyone, and I'm going to push it down and push it down. And then here I am two years later, guess what? It's still there, right? So we know for a fact time doesn't heal. Absolutely. Yeah, so Absolutely. it just goes in that. I want to talk a little bit, that brought me to another subject, is uh, social media. Social media and grief. So my experience has been this. After Donovan died, which is my second nephew, there, it was 40 minutes before it actually hit Facebook. It, we hadn't even told all of the family members yet. Number wow. one, it had hit Facebook. So my advice that I give out quite often is you don't post on social media until the immediate family has posted because they may choose not to post anything at all. No pictures. They may not want to talk about it right now. And so we have to give them that space and that respect, right? Do you agree with that? I agree with that 100%. I mean, you want to think about social media as being a community because it right. really is. It's, it is an online community. And so, you know, imagine 40 minutes after, you know, somebody dies, I'm yelling it from the rooftops. And somebody who either hasn't heard it may be finding out in a very shocking way or 
like you said, they may not be ready to process mm-hmm. it that way. And mm-hmm. that's not fair to them. Mm-hmm. So I, I love that rule of thumb of wait till the immediate family knows. Right. Wait till they've had a moment to process. Even asking them, what are you comfortable with? Yes. And then go forward from there on social media. Now, the second part of social media that we talk about quite often is when we see people like this sweet lady that are still posting two years later pictures, how broken their heart is. I find that a lot of times they get beat up. That's where they get the comments. You know, I don't want to see this anymore. Or people start dropping them. I feel like when I see people that are there, even months and weeks later, years later, I at least try to give them a a little heart. I'm here for you. I'm willing to listen because they need to talk about it. Hey, don't forget I'm here for you. I just do a little tap, you know, and just letting them know. Sometimes I go in deeper depending on what the post is saying. But what, what do you feel about that? I so agree with you. I have an example of exactly what you're talking about. I have a friend who Um, she lost her son. Her son was 25 years old and was in a car accident and was, it was killed. And it was a very sudden loss and very painful. And this particular person is on social media for her business and her life. And that's just what she likes to do. And so she did this really great thing and, and kind of was taking people on the journey with her and posting things about her son. And, and it had been several months and she had a post up about him And this person, believe it or not, who was a pastor, said, um, there is a time for joy and a time for mourning, and the time for mourning is over. Oh, my. Posted that in the comments of her Facebook post. Oh. Which was a horrible thing to say, of course. And for this mom who was clearly grieving the loss of her son and you know in some ways she she did do the grief recovery program and so that had helped her tremendously but she still wanted to celebrate and talk about his life that was really important Mm -hmm. for her she still had days where it was hard that it's his birthday and he's not here and all those kind of things so this was her outlet and so for somebody to post that it was so hurtful because what she really needed was people to say oh I'm so you know, I'm so happy to celebrate with you or, wow, this must be a really difficult day for you. And just be with her on that journey because it's her journey. I don't know about what things you post, but some of the things that I post are, if I were near you, I'd give you a hug right now. Or I'll just say, ouch. I just want them to know that I'm hearing them, that I'm with them, I'm feeling them. Um, there are no perfect words, you know, that that will make them feel better. Or even like uh, sometimes Erica will post about Donovan or Austin's birthday, and I'll do a little happy birthday post to them so that she knows I'm still thinking of them too. Yeah, you know, are there any things that stand out for you? It, it does. I think you touched on something that's really important, and that is when someone is grieving my role as being somebody in their life, whether it's a Facebook connection or in-person connection, is not to make them feel better. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when somebody's hurting, we think, oh, my job is to make them feel better. And when somebody is grieving a loss, whether it happened yesterday or five years ago, my job and my role is not to make them feel happy. My job is to let them know I'm with you and I hear you And I'm an ear if you need to talk. That's it. That's the extent. And so all those communications that you talked about were wonderful. Any of those kind of things that just said, wow, you know, I can't even imagine how difficult this must be for you. Or I just want you to know that I'm here and that I love you. Or like you said, the hearts. Or I'm sending you a hug, depending on who it is, obviously. Depends on how close you come. But as long as we're communicating, I'm just here. Yeah. I'm here. I hear what you're saying. I can't walk in your shoes, but I can certainly walk beside you. I tell clients all the time, don't try to fix it. You can't fix it. I could not fix it for Erica. I couldn't bring Austin back. No matter how hard I tried and how perfect I made the funeral and the services and everything for her, she was still missing Austin. And so I couldn't fix it. But being her support, that I could absolutely do. 
So yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's amazing. This question is actually very short and so powerful. Will I ever feel normal again? Will I ever have closure? Wow. What a, that's a great, great question. And, you know, and I, I think, Sharon, you actually can provide some really great insight into this um, because of your experience and, and what we got to talk about yeah. last time with Austin. Um, but I will say uh, the answer to that is yes. Yes, I, I think one of the problems that we have in our in our society is that when there is a loss, there's this belief that that means I'm only going to be a half a person for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even even my story with the significant losses that I experienced as a child, the expectation is is that I would live a a half of a life. I will never experience a full life again, and that simply isn't true. Most of the time, we just don't have the tools and the understanding to, to live that out, right? We don't understand that, that there's tools out there, there's grief recovery, there's things that we can walk through that, that support us in feeling that way. It's, we can't just wait it out. That's not going to work. But yes, we can. And I can be normal and have an, a, feel normal and have a, a normal life. And it doesn't mean that I'm doing a disservice if I've lost a loved one, it doesn't mean I'm dishonoring them either. Somehow we think, well, if I'm feeling happy again, I'm dishonoring. Yeah. Right? Wow. Yeah. And as far as the question about, will I ever have closure? In grief recovery, we don't um, buy into closure. And I remember when Austin died and people were talking about closure, it seemed like I was going to slam the door on my relationship with Austin and that I was never going to have him again. And that was awful to me, the thought of that and hearing that. In grief recovery, we talk about completion. So the answer to your question is that you can absolutely complete your relationship with your loved one that has passed on to isolation, loneliness, and loss. 100%, I believe that. I also believe that I am living my life. And Erica is living her life. And she, the one thing she said to me is, I can't be living a life in tears and crying and in a bed all the time. She says, there has to be something different. And that is when we found grief recovery and grief recovery was that difference because through completing my relationship with Austin, I was able to live a life fully and he empowers me now because I feel like I have a spiritual relationship with him. We still talk about Austin as if he is part of our life. We talk about him all of the time. We talk about Donovan all of the time. They are still part of our lives, which is so, so totally amazing. So sharing that part on closure, I think, is really important because people not hearing and understanding that they have to close the door right there. I love that you talked about that because I think that is one of the most important pieces to remember about about grief is that people feel like if I let go of the sadness and the pain, then now I, they're gone. Right. This is the only attachment I've had to that person. Now it's gone and now they're totally gone and I don't want to let that go. And I think what you represent so beautifully, Sharon, is completing the relationship to the pain yeah. and the tears and the negativity to where now you have this really endearing relationship mm -hmm. with Austin. He's not here, but like you said, I have a spiritual relationship with him. I talk about him. He's part of our lives. I didn't close the door on him. As a matter of fact, because I was able to grieve and grieve properly, now I can talk about him even more. I have more freedom and the attachment is still there. Yes. Exactly. Yesterday, I was looking for pictures of Donovan. I was actually looking for baby pictures of Donovan. And so I ended up going through a bunch of older pictures of Donovan. And I just went through a file that I had. And there were all these pictures of Donovan. And I was smiling as I was looking at him. And I just said at the end, I miss that face. But it was good because it was a good memory lane for Donovan and I. I was filled with joy. I wasn't tearful and crying. Fond memories of those photos came back to me, remembering those times, remember his goofy craziness. All of that stuff comes back when we have completion, when all of the pain is removed. If I could just let everybody see it and feel it, I, that would be magical, right? 
Oh, most definitely. And I, I can relate even in the same way, even from my, my childhood experiences. Like I can talk about my childhood without it being this thing that takes me out. And I can even look at my childhood and I can remember positive experiences about my childhood without it being just a connection to the pain. Right. Right. And that, I, I wanted to touch on that earlier, and we didn't touch on that. There are 43 known losses that we know can cause a grieving experience. And that's why I think, you and I talked about this a few weeks ago, why we're also having to get the word out about grief recovery. The word is grief recovery, and I think it throws people for a little second, right? It's grief recovery. Why would I go to grief recovery for sexual abuse? Why would I go to grief recovery if my dog passed away? Why would I go to grief recovery if I'm just my not happy in my marriage, right? And so getting that word out that you can recover from the pain in your heart, right? And the loss in your heart is so important. And letting people know all of the losses that absolutely do exist. I, yeah, I, I so agree with you. You know, I, I even, you know, let people know, even life events that we have that are positive, sometimes are also grieving experiences. You know, I often share, I didn't get married until I was almost 40. And so I had been single a very long time and I love my husband dearly. And, you know, we have such a, a, a great marriage. However, when we were first married, I grieved yeah. because my whole life changed. Yeah. My singlehood was gone mm -hmm. and all these things that I was used to weren't there anymore. All of a sudden it was like, oh, it's not just me. And, oh, I have to think about you and, oh, you stay here all the time. And oh my goodness, you know, it was this big life change. And I tell people even, you know, when they go into empty nest or even when their children go from baby to toddler, to, yeah. they grieve. Yes. Even though these are celebrations, we still grieve. And I think grief needs to be understood in that way. It's something that we experience often, not, not like just every now and then. I want to talk about that more. Great. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, that's where we're going to pick up. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll see you back here right after the break. I've been into cars ever since I was six years old. I helped my dad build race cars in our driveway. Dave Reeves, owner of Reeves Complete Auto Center. I love cars. I've been in automotive service my whole life. I ran my dad's wrecking yard and rearing shop, managed several auto repairs until I opened my own auto repair facility. Reeves on Ruther in Canyon Country. I learned customer service and honest communication make the difference. Reeves, your complete auto service center. Call Reeves at 252-1400. At Discovery Cube Los Angeles, every day is an adventure. LA's newest science center brings education to life and lets guests climb on a rock wall, soar over California in a simulated helicopter, or score a goal against an LA Kings hockey player. It's like a theme park for the mind. And beginning May 26th, take a bite out of Dino Summer with your prehistoric pass to the new Dinosaurs Around the World exhibit. All at Discovery Cube Los Angeles. Get your tickets now at la.discoverycube.org. Marinated strips of steak grilled to perfection with onions, peppers, jack and cheddar cheese, ranchero sauce. Mouth watering yet? I thought it would. I could keep going, but I won't tease you like that. I'll just tell you where to go. Cabo Cabana and Stevenson Ranch, where fresh is just the beginning. Delicious tacos, burritos, enchiladas, tostadas, Baja authentic style Mexican food that you just won't be able to resist. What more could you ask for? Cabo Cabana on the old road in Stevenson Ranch. There's only one Santa Clarita plastic surgeon who is Yale trained and board certified, Dr. Justin Heller. To be a board certified plastic surgeon like myself, what that truly entails is about five to seven years of honed surgical training in reconstructive, all areas, as well as aesthetics, which means your facelifts, your breast augmentations, your body contouring, true training and board certification. In fact, that's the only board certified area that can be achieved in this realm. Dr. Justin Heller, warm, understanding, always available for guidance because he's local HellerPlasticSurgery.com. Your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome back, Santa Clarita. Thank you so much for joining us. 
You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station, and I am Sharon Brubaker, and this is the Grief Recovery Hour. My amazing guest today is Sandy Atmore. She's a life coach and advanced certified grief recovery specialist. Just prior to the break, we were talking about the different types of losses that a person can experience through a lifetime that can cause a grieving experience. And you and I were talking about becoming an empty nester or just having your child Uh, grow. Not having the infant stage anymore can be a grieving experience. We don't know what and when that thing is going to be for you, but people experience all sorts of things at different times. But just prior to the break, you were saying that even a happy experience can be a grieving experience and that Grief recovery is a process that we'll use continually through our lives. So I want you to elaborate a little bit more on that. Absolutely. I think that's one of the most important messages that I feel that we need to get out there about grief is that we all experience grief. We all go through losses. Uh, And like we were just talking about, you know, I often share, I smoked meth for three and a half years. And when I walked away, listen, I wouldn't change that for the world. That's a miracle. I still grieved. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's how I'd coped for three and a half years, and all of a sudden I didn't have it anymore. And it was a whole new change in my life. And we need to, to be able to talk about grief in that context. But the other side of it is that most of us don't learn how to grieve. Right. So what we need to understand is that we, most of us have experienced multiple losses and have not had the tools or learned how to grieve. And therefore, most of us carry around a lot of unresolved grief, and that unresolved grief ends up being very detrimental to our lives. Either I'm depressed, or I don't have energy, or I'm out of the moment, or I'm having angry outbursts, or I'm just stuck, or I'm isolating, or I'm doing these types of things, not realizing it's because I never learned how to grieve. And so with grief recovery, not only do I get to work through the experiences, some of the experiences that we've been talking about, but for future... I now have a tool that I can use over and over and over and over again so that I can continue to stay present in my life because it's not if a loss will happen, it's simply when. Exactly, exactly. It's so amazing. That's so beautiful. It's so cool to be able to talk about that and really get the word out that the, that death is not the only grief that we will experience, which is really cool. So I want to segue a little bit. Thank you so much. We could go on this subject for hours, but you guys probably aren't going to want to hear hear us talk about it here. Let's talk about the different types of grief recovery classes that you and I teach and the different ways that we teach those classes, right? So we uh, teach pet loss. That's That's actually a program. These are actual programs, guys, that have a set amount of time and they're designed to go with one or two uh, losses so there's pet loss when children grieve which is for the adults of children that are grieving but our most popular program is the grief recovery program because it sort of encompasses a lot of different losses right yes absolutely now one of the things I wanted to expand on is that you and I are both advanced grief recovery specialists I believe there's about 8,000 grief recovery specialists in the entire world and out of that there are about 30 i might be wrong on my numbers so don't quote me on this guys 30 to 50 that are actually advanced grief recovery specialists at this time and being an advanced grief recovery specialist means that we are absolutely certified to be able to do our grief recovery program online yes and that's new with the grief recovery institute and i didn't want to do it at first (laughs) i was like that is not going to work And it's been an amazing program to be able to absolutely meet the person where they are. Yes. And they're they're comfortable in their home. You're in your office or in your home, and you're absolutely seeing each other online. Because some people don't understand that you're actually seeing each other face to face. And you're actually walking them through the grieving process. It's been such a rewarding program for me. How has it been for you? Phenomenal. I was so, uh, unlike you, I was very excited, actually. (laughs) 
<laughs> when they said they were gonna, going to give us that certification for online. And, and I understood why it took so long for, for us to have that. But I will say, you know, there's situations where I, I may have a client who's either in another state or even in another country where they don't have a grief recovery specialist close by. And so they're able to work with me online. I have some clients where, you know, we're in Southern California, even though it's a 30 minute drive without traffic, it's a three hour drive with traffic. And so that online model works really, really well. So they're not needing to get stressed out. And, you know, some people, it, it could be a single mom or there's a childcare issue. And so having the ability to work online is very convenient and I think in, in some cases it provides a certain amount of safety, which I think is kind of what you were alluding to in terms right. of, you know, the client can be in their home. Yes. And sometimes if I've experienced a significant loss, I feel safer in my yes. home. And yes, I'm still seeing you and I'm still looking in your eyes and I'm holding you with my eyes, but we're in, in the house. You're in your house and I'm in my office. And for some people that just works really well. So it's been great. I've loved it. I think my resistance to it was that I wanted to be near them. I wanted to be so close that I could reach out and touch them, or I wanted to be near them, or I thought the energy, my energy wasn't going to come across on online, and it absolutely is not true. I mean, I have grieved with people who online who have had recent deaths, and they have gotten to recovery just as if they were sitting in my office. So yes. I definitely wanted to clarify that, it has been a very rewarding uh, process. I, like you just said, one of my fir very first was someone in LA. And it's just that they didn't want to come to Santa Clarita. And so he is in his home, I'm in my office, and we are working that way. So it's definitely a rewarding program. Absolutely. Sandy, we're going to be uh, ending our beautiful show here. But before we end, I want you to tell people how they can get in touch with you. How can they reach out to you? How can they contact you? And do you have any programs coming up? Absolutely. Um, I will have a group uh, starting in June. So it'll be a, a grief recovery group. I do group and I do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one in person and one-on-one -on -one online as well. Uh, I do have a website. It's griefunchained.com um, or people can just call me at 323-698-5570. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandy, for being in here and enlightening us for this one hour on grief. I am going to put Sandy's information in the Facebook Live, guys, so you can all go in there and just tap on it and get it. Again, Sharon Brubaker, The Grief Recovery Hour. Thank you so much.